Uh, well, on behalf of the New York Film Academy, I'd like to thank you for spending some of your time with us. My pleasure. Uh, we have plenty of time to talk about the Screen Actors Guild, but what I'd like to talk a little bit about first is your career. Great. The last thing I want to talk about is the Screen Actors Guild. I have to do it all the time. That'll be like work. The rest is fun. Uh, you have been, from what I can tell, on 70 different television shows. You've been a series regular on 10% of those, which is quite fantastic. Right. Uh, you have been in 25 films. You have been elected to the uh, um, uh, as a president of the Screen Actors Guild not once but twice right. as well. Uh, you also started a television show back in the 80s called The White Shadow. Yes. My mother is still in love with you. <laughs> uh, so my question um, is, I'm sure probably the same question everybody else has. How do you keep a career going as an actor? Well, that's a good question. I think, uh, well, for me, I think it's important to stay in the game creatively. Quite frankly, not necessarily what agents or management might advise. Sometimes there can be a feeling of, uh, well, you know, when you're hot, you're hot, and you're not, you're not. And boy, if they're offering you, you got to keep going and don't stop no matter what. And I try to, uh, you know, work according to demand, but also to be open to other opportunities. I got myself out of one TV show because I had an opportunity to go back and. Uh, work at the American Repertory Theater and teach at Harvard and what was going to be a year turned into about three years. And I certainly never regretted it and didn't listen to the, uh, oh, well, if you leave that long, you know, they'll forget all about you. Well, a little maybe, but then you're back and working again. I guess what I'm saying is to have a creative life uh, involves, I think, you know, in, at least in my case, uh, getting on the stage and doing little independent uh, projects and uh, big commercial ones and teaching some and writing some and doing all the things that keep you alive and functioning and it works on your imagination because uh, the, it's a business and a lot of times there's a pigeonholing that's understandable and you play a part that's successful and uh, the money says just keep doing that we'll just keep selling that it's sort of like a McDonald's burger or something don't, don't change and most of us, you know, you want to change. You want to take other uh, chances and uh, find other creative outlets. And I think in the long run, then you're better and a little more flexible and you're more able to stay in the game. Some people actually become actors and their, their goals are different. They, and I think that's the case more and more these days. It would seem that uh, They'd like to get a great deal of success and make a lot of money and go into real estate, which is fine. I mean, that's one choice. I remember uh, I was in my late 20s and I was getting offers and a guy uh, named Morris Mosley, he was a bookie in New York. He was just like a Damon Runyon character, really talked out of the side of his mouth. But mm -hmm. He said, you got to get one of these television series because you understand, you get a television series, you get a piece of the action, and if it goes seven or eight years, you never have to work again in your life. And I remember thinking, well, then I'd be 35. What's the point of that? You know, I want to do this. You know, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So, um, but for whatever it's worth, I, I think the important thing is to try to have a, a, a creative life. And in the long run, I think that keeps you, uh, I don't know if it keeps you younger, but it certainly keeps you more uh, open to your own creativity. It's the best I can put it. And most of our students here have their own initial reason for why they wanted to become an actor. Some, you know, did some theater and were told they were great. For you, when you first started as an actor, what was your motivation behind wanting to work as an actor? Well, I'll tell you a little if, uh, how I got into this, if, if that's right. I, I think it's probably helpful. Uh, I, I was always comfortable singing. My father sang very comfortably and openly and it was just uh, and there was always music around the house and uh, in the town where I live I were members of the Congregational Church Manhasset which is a little town on Long Island outside of New York and uh, and it had a great uh, adult choir and a youth choir and I remember these two, I was in eighth, ninth grade I guess and two of my friends in the shower were singing in the after basketball and they were singing as opposed to some rock and roll song 
they were singing the bass part for Exultate Deo. And I heard it once and just joined right in with them. And they went, you ought, to, you ought to join the choir. It's great because, you know, you can hear the music and you got a good ear and voice and da-da-da-da. And I did. And this was a wonderful choir. We, uh, we put on a big musical each year and we toured Europe and we sang in Carnegie Hall and it was uh, very exciting. Uh, and funny thing for me, there was a drama club in high school and it never occurred to me. It wasn't, I probably went and saw a couple of shows I did, but I don't know, I didn't do that. I played sports and student government and stuff. But the choir was different. And, and I was a soloist and I wound up playing, uh, you know, Billy Bigelow and Carousel and Curly in Oklahoma and that kind of thing. And then I went to Amherst College as an undergrad and uh, one of the first things I did was to join a, a close harmony singing group. And in my second year, one of the seniors said, why don't you try out for one of the plays? Because I was sort of taking over for him as being the MC and cracking jokes and singing, singing solos. And I stupidly said, well, I've never done a play. He said, well, you played leads in musicals. It's plays just without the music. I went, oh, that's true. So I tr tried out and I got a role, I got another role. So as I was, and I was playing uh, a basketball when I was in college, so it wasn't, I always thought I was lucky that I was at a little place like Amherst where it wasn't, uh, an area where you kind of chose, you know, the theater area. It was just something I dropped in and did it, and then I went about my life. But I, I played a number of roles. I did Long Day's Journey, and I played uh, the title role in the Scottish play, and I did this stuff. And I thought, like a lot of this is 1965, 66, I was going to graduate. And this was, uh, Vietnam was at its height, and there were a lot of students like me who weren't necessarily going to be lawyers, but were probably going to go to law school, unless you were going to go for a PhD in your major. So that was in the back of my mind as what next? And the head of the department, a man named Walter Boughton, I left something out. There was a very encouraging conductor and teacher in high school, a man named Robley Lawson, who really taught me a lot, was very inspiring, and so he was important. And Walter Boughton said, you know, there's a fellowship to Yale that has always gone to a musician, but uh, but you, you can also go to an actor, and it, I think if you apply for that, you get a good chance of getting it, and it's a big fellowship, and it's all matched by a scholarship, and kind of saying, and he was encouraging, you know, and I thought, well, that's an itch maybe I could scratch, and it sounded good. I thought, it won't scare my parents. I can tell them I'm, I'm going to Yale to graduate school. <laughs> and I remember going to my father to tell him once I knew I was going to do this and try out that I was going to try out for this. And I remember he was sitting up in bed and he had a, my copy of Martin Chuzzlewood. He loved Dickens, but he never read that one. And, uh, and he'd always been supportive, you know, of me doing this, but not necessarily as a career. And I told him, I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply for this fellowship, which apparently they think I'll be able to get and go to Yale Drama School and try to make a life as an actor. And he kind of looked at me and he said, aren't you a little tall? <laughs> it was so sweet, because I was about to say six, six and all. It was his way of being encouraging. So, well, so then I, I did, uh, I could tell you more about it, but I, I, uh, as soon as I was out of Amherst, I, I did a summer of summer stock, and I went to Yale Drama School, and the next summer I did another summer of summer stock. I went to Williamstown, and I, uh, at one point, tried out, there's too much to this story, but encouragement. Lots of encouragement. Stella Adler, Virginia Gilmore, Robert Lewis, all saying, you can do this, you're doing fine. And I, I uh, auditioned for a small part in the musical Promises, Promises in the fall of 1968. And I got it. And I asked for a leave of absence in my third year at Yale. And Robert Brewstein, with whom I worked years later and went back to Harvard with and all was Absolutely not. You know, you have to make your choice between being an artist or being part of this commercial theater. And I always said from the beginning, you know, that I wanted to do it all. I mean, I was happy to do the Caucasian chalk circle at the Guthrie, but I also wanted to do Broadway, movies, and the whole thing, you know. So I thought, no, no, I'm going to do this. And that was, and then I was very, very fortunate. I auditioned almost immediately after we opened for 1776 and got the role of Thomas Jefferson, and Otto Preminger was there opening night and had me within a month had signed me to play a, a lead in a movie opposite Liza Minnelli and five picture deal. I mean, I was just off and running and back. So I never look back and think, oh, maybe I should have stayed and not take the leap. 
So that's, I mean, kind of a long explanation. So it wasn't something I just fell into, but it wasn't exactly a plan. I did love doing it, but I will tell you honestly, there are people out there, and they've had great careers, who, who one of the reasons they say they did well, including Barbara Streisand, is because they were told they couldn't do it, mm. including Streisand's mm. mother, you know, so she said that was what motivated her. I am not made of such stern stuff. I was encouraged, you know, you can do this, you're doing this well, you, you have a nice, pre you know, it was all positive. There's always somebody going, ah, what are you doing, you know, but mostly it was that. And I needed all the encouragement uh, I could get. And then once I was more confident, then, you know, then I was ready to go. One thing I point out to younger actors, the reason I gave you this long version, is that when I started, and started so quickly, uh, the, this small role I played in Promises, Promises was, uh, was my Broadway debut and I got my equity card. But it was the 28th role I'd played on stage by then. And it was the smallest role. And even Thomas Jefferson was the 29th, was also big, but not, not big the way you, you know, the roles you play when you're in summer stock in college. I mean, you know, I'm not exactly sure what my Macbeth was like when I was 21, but at least I did it and I remembered it all, you know, so. <laughs> Anyway. Right. And so your basketball that you had, I'm assuming, may have led a little bit into the role of the White Shadow? Oh, we created it. Oh, you know all that. I went to, one of the guys I went to, uh, let's see, how do we do this? Um, when I was in high school, basketball was a big part of my life. Coach, a man I'm still in touch with named Fritz Mueller, wonderful man. And I, I was tall and I could run and I could shoot a little and I was able to contribute and by the time I was a senior, I was all everything, you know. But, but when I was a junior, I played on a team. I was the only white guy in the starting five, in fact, in the first seven. And we were fast and we were good. It was a small high school. And, it was, and the guys I was playing with were also the backfield and, the, and the, 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 the relay team and everything else. And there, two of them were brothers named Thorpe and one guy was named Jackson and Henley. And so I used to tell stories to friends of mine when I was at Amherst. And I played there, and I was captain there, but one of the lines a friend of mine reminded me, when I was there as a freshman at Amherst, which is a great school, but I wasn't going there. I mean, I was, you know, they have need-blind admission, so if you're in, you're in, and you're it's covered, but it wasn't about basketball. I knew I was going to play. And the guy said to me, what's it like up there? And I said, two things. First of all, for the first time in my life, I am the biggest and the blackest guy on the floor. He went, oh, really? You know, so, different world. And I said, and the other thing is, in this situation, uh, I'm helping bring the ball down. And this friend of mine said, ooh, that is not good. That is really not good. I'm not who you want on your team bringing the ball down. Not a dribbler. Other things, maybe. So, uh, but I used to tell stories as we fought to try to have winning seasons and failed. Uh, about this great time and these guys I played with. What, what, with a, and one of my good friends was a fellow named Dave Marine, who was a football player, didn't play basketball. So then I started a career. I'd done a couple of television series, Adam's Rib, and then I'd done a series called The Manhunter. It was about a, uh, a bounty hunter, a guy who'd been an ex-Marine and was on CBS and shot it in 1974, about the time I was 30. And I went down to, to visit him and his wife and some others and all go fishing down off of Gulf Shores. And we came back and I was in the, uh, the, uh, one of the airports, I think it was Mobile, Alabama. And a bunch of kids, uh, predominantly black, and this is before the term African American had, so I'm, I'm current, but it was about happening right about then. Uh, predominantly black all surrounded me to talk to me because they recognized me from the Manhunter. I was uh, wearing a blazer and kind of my height. And this friend of mine, Dave Marine, has written, I think it's now five books. He's a very imaginative, very funny guy, not in show business. And he looked at the image and he said to me uh, about a year or so later, he said, you know what you, you, know what you should think about doing? And he said, y you should create a, a series about a guy who's a, a, a basketball player, a guy like you from New York, Long Island, played someplace, played in the pros, hurts his knee the way you did against Holy Cross, so he lost a step, and that's enough for him to have to know what to do next, and gets this tantalizing offer to him of stepping into this really difficult coaching situation 
in a, in a, in a ghetto school. And he said, well, isn't that a really good for a series? I said, it's a great idea for a series, I think. So he said, why don't you find somebody you trust and you can be a producer too and make something happen. All right, so I had worked a lot with Blythe Danner on stage and on screen, and on television, very fond of her, and her husband, Bruce Paltrow, who's no longer with us. He was a good friend. He'll probably be mostly remembered as being the father of Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, so I went to him with this, and he was also a Long Island guy. He was raised in the town right next to where I'm from, Great Neck. And I brought him this idea, and he said, and we talked a little about working together, and he always called me Kenny. He said, I think this is a winner, Kenny. And he started developing it. And we went in and pitched it to CBS and got the, uh, we had the on-air commitment. A lot of people said another show, I mean, MTM was fine, mm -hmm. but it wasn't created at all by MTM. We, we, we actually had the commitment and then had to figure where we were going to go with it, where we would lay off the deal, as they say, you know, what studio to go to the network, even the way we had the network commitment. And it got down to MTM and Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you think? It's your call, Bruce. You're the business guy in this. He said, I like them both. He said, uh, Warner Brothers deal may look a little better financially on paper. He said, but for the kind of show we're doing, he said, I don't know, there's something about the, these guys for MTM in the meeting that I like. I said, well, what is it? He said, how can I put this? Uh, they all wear cashmere sweaters and none of them swear. <laughs> it just made me laugh and I knew what he meant because we were going to be going into a very fine line of doing a family show but also touching on a lot of difficult things that the network wanted no part of. They literally said to us, if you can imagine, those of you who are familiar with The White Shadow, we wish you well but we want you to stay away from sex, drugs and crime. He said, the point of the show <laughs> is that that's what surrounds this world and basketball and da 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 so we pitched it and we uh, got it on the air and we had, we had believed at the time that if we could get critical acclaim in all three areas, by that I mean the TV critics and also uh, the black press, which was right at that time becoming more and more in the language referred to as the African American press nationwide, and the sports press, if we had that kind of legitimacy that we'd, we'd be in good shape, and we did. Critically, we did really well. We only lasted three years, but considering what we were bringing to the table and how unusual it was, that uh, that wasn't bad. When you looked at the map of uh, the, uh, you know, what's the word for it? You know, the anyway, the breakdown of of uh, who's watching. It, it very much looked like the political map. I mean, the whole wide open spaces were all watching Little House on the Prairie, and all the big cities. I mean, who do you think was watching in Philadelphia and Cleveland and Chicago and L.A.? It was all white shadow centered. So it was, uh, it was a successful show, uh, one that I was, I was very fond of doing and I still appreciate when I hear about it from people and from, from not only from uh, young people who are now people in their 40s, but also from their mothers, you know, who said, oh, thank you, that was a really good show, <laughs> that, was, that helped us, you know. <laughs> so uh, so it's, not, uh, it's all nice memories. Fantastic. So we're going to open it up to questions for the audience now. Uh, if you guys want, you just go straight up over here. And while we're sort of waiting for everybody to, to filter over there, of course, I do have the question of the hour. Uh, the big AFTRA SAG merger. Right. What, obviously you can't touch on all points, but what do you think some of the key points that the business may change as a result of that? Well, let me tell you, uh, it, I'm not exactly sure how to answer the phrase the way you phrased it. Let me put it differently. There's no question in my mind that, that actors are far better off represented by one union rather than two in a, for a number of reasons, but the key is collective bargaining. For us to be separated unions, it's a very, very easy for management, and if I were management, I'd do the same thing, to play one against the other. And that's death. You know, the big studios, they fight tooth and nail, but boy, when they come into negotiation, they are one big monolith in agreement. And we very much need that. There are other issues where now with the divisions, you have to make certain levels for pension and health at, on the after contract. And on another contract, you have to pay two sets of dues, two sets of initiation fees. It's crazy by now. And because of the digital 
aspect of film, all the areas of jurisdiction are, are really blurred. So there are a lot of very good reasons for us to be merged, but the most significant has to do with collective bargaining as one and the kind of revenue that we can develop. The best analogy I can give you is imagine if the Teamsters, which is a very, very powerful union, if there was another smaller other Teamsters union that, that management could go to and then negotiate back and forth between the two of them. It's, it's ineffective and it's not in the interest of actors. So I, I assure you, and I don't even see, I, at this point I'm so convinced that merger's good, I'm starting to think it can cure cancer, and it's not, you know. <laughs> it's not gonna cure every single problem, but we're very, much, much better off as one merged union. The other aspect, just so you know, which probably a lot of you do know this, is that SAG now is uh, about 125,000 members. And AFTRA is about 70,000 members, 45,000 of whom are dual card members. So with this merger, this whole new single union becomes about 150,000. So it's not quite like, and it's different cultures. I don't think it's quite as complicated as some might suggest. There are a lot harder mergers that have been done. But it, uh, history has shown us the most obvious example being the AFL-CIO, had the same prop when they finally came together, the stronger in terms of representing you with management and the fighting for the kinds of uh, the safeties and uh, salaries and uh, residual payments and all the rest of it. So that's the SAG thing. Wonderful. Yes, young lady. Hi. Hello, Mr. Howard. How are you? Hi. My first question is, how important is certain training helpful to your career? I know some people um, mentioned the Groundlings or the Second City Improv as far as having that on your resume as to assisting you in helping to get great jobs in the industry. So how important is that? Sure. I think, uh, at least my experience, is that it should be all of it. Uh, uh, I mentioned summer stock musicals and, and doing, being the stand-up guy for the singing group. There was one point uh, where my first year at Yale, I was introduced uh, by one of the gals that I worked with in Summerstock to a guy, a guy who talked like that, whose name was Rennie, who ran a place called the House of the, House of the Zodiac, which was completely a mob joint outside of New Haven. So during the week, I was studying with Stella Adler and Robert Lewis and scenes from Ibsen and Shaw and Shakespeare and whatever. And on the weekend, I was singing all of the Nelson Riddle sets for Sinatra at, uh, at the House of the Zodiac and, uh, you know, dressed like a singing waiter and doing all this. And it was, it was all good. You know, it was all just growing as a performer. And I, I was always averse to the notion of, uh, are you an actor or are you an entertainer? And this, this fellow, a British guy named Jeremy Guyton, and we've been in touch over the years, and he was charming. But at that point, he was being very... Uh, much a, a, a teacher at the Yale School of Drama. And he said, Ken, you, you must be careful with these other things you're doing because if you're, not, if you're not careful, you may find yourself someplace in Las Vegas wearing a tuxedo and singing into a microphone. <laughs> and I remember thinking, and that's a bad thing? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it sounds good. So I think, you know, improv and groundlings, and then you went off and, you know, did... Uh, some production of Pure Gint, and then you're back, and you're doing a talk radio. It's all good. It's all one big piece. You'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, at the early uh, experiences of, of some of our most renowned actors. I'll tell you one who's a great example. I saw him in, in a, a Gene Hackman in an interview, and they said, uh, what were the first things you did? He said, comedy review. Most of them, comedy review. and funny stuff, slapstick going back and forth. And, oh. Charles Durning was a stand-up comic up in Buffalo and going around and before he started playing small character parts for Joe Papp and Shakespeare. You know, it all adds up. So I, I wouldn't, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. I, I take on all the things that, that nurture you creatively. And you gotta make a living, but, and sometimes uh, even, even the most, as long as you don't get trapped in it for too long, some of the, the more crass offerings in the show business can be very interesting and you can learn a lot from them. 
One more question. Um, you said, correct me if I'm wrong on the number, but you said it's currently 125,000 members of SAG. 125,000. 125. So what percentage of those are full-time working actors that don't have, like, this is how they make their living just off of acting, not side jobs? You have just hit upon the biggest problem. <laughs> the percentage is very small. It's, um, I'm not sure what it exactly it is, but it's, it isn't 15%. And of those, those who are really making money that uh, would, you would call substantial, that doesn't need to be uh, helped by other things, gets down to an even lower percent, lower than 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is, that is a, a real issue uh, in terms of, here, here's, well, it could be an issue either way. People who uh, have no interest in a, in a work stoppage of really you know, fighting for stuff because it doesn't really affect them, or vice versa. They think a work stoppage, a big strike's great because it also doesn't affect them. Uh, well, that's one of the things we're trying to sort out. I think those who are voting on contracts and are really uh, insistent within the union, we have to kind of find a way to separate and organize so that those who are really not involved at all, and I think it should be a very low bar. I mean, in the last 10 years, you have to have made some minimal amount of money. It means at least you're keeping your hand in, at least you're involved somehow. But it's problematic in ways, I'll tell you a way that I hadn't thought of that really doesn't come up in terms of how it's uh, a little skewed. Most of the famous producers and directors that you know, they all, one way or the other, have SAG cards. You know, Leslie Moonves has a SAG card, Steven Spielberg has a SAG card, I mean, all these... Were, so even, that's another strange part of it, that there are people with SAG cards that it's pretty much a vanity card. So that's, that's a difficulty. One of the problems with, with the, uh, one of the problems we run into a lot with the amount of salary in these unions, a great example are, are equity actors, real stage actors, who, if, if they're in the union, and I think they're better off being in the union, Saginaw, they may be managing to have a, a very reasonable life but there's only so much they're doing that's actually film or television when it comes to town, whether they're in Chicago or in New York, and they, they, you know, they're adding, they're supplementing their income, but they're really stage actors making uh, money on the stage, either in New York or various theaters. So you have to be careful how you, how you decide on the, the value. You know, we can't just be numbers. I think it has to be activity, involvement that way, and some small amount of numbers, but this is, one of the things I think we can improve with the merger, because it's a reset in terms of how some of these things have developed, but that's going to take time. It's a good question. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. I'm Gabriella, and um, I'm a recent student from NIFA, and I was uh, probably in the same boat as a lot of people um, looking into being in a union, and I saw that there's a way to actually just join after by paying the after dues and because of the merger with SAG do you would you recommend that step for a new actress or is there well with the merger it won't I, I we're gonna have to I think readdress how this is done it, right. it, it won't be that you can just come in and sign up as you can mm -hmm. with after that would be not good particularly because SAG has a certain uh, character to it, the, the card. At the same time, I think there have been certain things in place that haven't worked very well, a, a voucher system, this and that, we don't have to get into it, but haven't quite worked this out very well, and that's a big part of what we're dealing with now. What makes you uh, viable? Uh, one of the things I think, you know, you don't want people working off the card, that gets very difficult, but if you have someone who shows up who's done a lot of work and are creative, but it's been non-union, uh, you know, whether it's summer stock or various things or little independent films. I, I think they should be welcome because they're experienced and, and then pay dues. You can't keep going back and forth, you know, it's a choice in terms of career. But that's different than just coming in and signing up. Right. We're looking into, uh, it's probably it's going to be a lot of math, figuring out what happens to somebody like yourself who's graduated from uh, from a whole program that's very established and understood, is that a certain amount, maybe not everything, but certain points so that then with the first job 
you know, you can move on. This is all doable. It ta this takes a lot, kind of a lot of bookkeeping. But I think what the result should be is that someone who's working and is involved and wants to build a career is encouraged to join the union and to pay over time, perhaps smaller, more as they go on. And, uh, and I, I believe, I, I think that it's a world that's changing very rapidly before us, but I think those who advise to go non-union uh, in this day for actors is thinking very small. By that I mean I don't think you can have a really established career and go anywhere and stay non-union. That won't happen. Mm -hmm. So if you're dabbling a little, I guess you could get, but I don't know how that would really work because with it, the opportunity itself uh, carries with it at least a Taft-Hartley you know, thing. You can do it three times and you're in. So uh, uh, I think when the opportunity presents itself, I would, I would say you can join a union in the I incremental steps that will be there. Uh, if you mean should you, should you sign up for after right now before they merge so that then you're in there anyway, I'm not sure how that works. I guess. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I guess so. Um, I'm not sure if that's in your interest. I'm not sure if it's in your interest financially or not. I think it doesn't matter if you're really established in doing this stuff. It's not going to be hard to get in. Uh, what it costs, we'll still have to figure out what those numbers are, are going to be. Uh, uh, my hope is that, and all this is subject to change, but in my mind, if you were to add what you have to pay as a dual card member for the two sets of dues, it would be nice, at least if starting out, that what, what you're paying is the new dues are less than that, or at least not more than that. Right. That would make sense. Right. Uh, and, and, I th and also, I, I keep having to remind some of the people I'm working with in this on both sides, both with AFTRA and SAG, it's hard for them to get out of the mindset of, well, after we're merged, then which AFTRA thing as opposed to which SAG thing? You say, it's gone. Legally, it's gone. It's not there anymore. It's one union. Mm -hmm. And so all this is, is based on one, one union contract. That's a big. That's a big change. It's a very so. Sometimes even in conversation, we, oh, oh, right. It's like hard for them to think that way. And I, I assure you that I, I know I'm straying a little bit from your question, but mm -hmm. but okay. you'll be in in a stronger union once we're merged. Okay. But you'll just be in a stronger union in terms of okay. how negotiations work. And 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 I'll even tell you how successful negotiations like this really should work, is the representatives of the union, in this case it would be me, but who's ever in my position with others, are going to man management and saying, you have to work with us mm -hmm. to improve things for our performers so that we don't have to go into a work stoppage to demand it. We don't want to do that. No. But you know, you need to help us with this, because we now, and also as a merged union, if we do that, it shuts down shuts down the industry. That's not what we want to do. And it shouldn't be something done in the press, and it shouldn't be ultimatums, and it's conversations that wind up in hallways and outside of the meeting and behind closed doors where they kind of figure out with the help of accountants and lawyers how to make it a little better for us so that everybody, you know, give up a little piece of the pie. We'll be able to protect a lot of people in terms of their health care, in terms of their pensions, in terms of being able to put food on the table and keep going. It's doable if you keep the big, uh, you know, ego, uh, ego against ego. Because, boy, when you get into that in our business, I'm not even sure, you know, they talk about actors' egos, but, but let me tell you, <laughs> once you go up against, you know, heads of studios and big directors, you know, it's a lot of egos there. So it takes a lot of just calming the waters, but I think it can be done. And I think with that uh, power that we'll have as, as one union, we'll be able to accomplish a lot more. Right. And um, the reason why I asked that question first was because um, the question I'm piggybacking is I'm interested in um, work outside of the United States because I speak another language. And so I wasn't sure how that would affect um, work outside of the U.S. Like how many associations does SAG and AFTRA have when they would merge? Would it be a little bit stronger to work outside of the U.S., or is it mostly just a United no, States? No, 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 you can go anywhere when you're, uh, oh, what other, what, what's the other language? Portuguese. Well, that's even, that's cool. 
Uh, <laughs> one of the things, one of the boards I'm on is FIA, you know, which is from the French. It's uh, Fédération Internationale des Artistes, and that's and and, and SAG and AFTRA are there. So the inter the international connection in unions is very strong, extremely strong. If you saw what happened with the Hobbit, and with mm -hmm. sorry, yeah. Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah. It was a big issue, and that was all the yeah. unions stepping up and saying, we're with you, and you know, so mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's an added uh, thing in your arsenal, the fact that you speak the other language. I would go as soon as you could and do something there mm -hmm. and have a bilingual co career. Why not? Yeah, I guess because the steps are like, is it join union or go there, or is it... In well, I, I think if you get it, a lot of times, as happened with me at least in all three of them, is very often the job, and I think it's probably the way it ought to be, the job, the audition, the job precedes it. You know, they, they don't say, oh, because you're not in the union. They just taft hardly it and whatever and work out how you pay, and there you go. Cool. So I would, uh, I think that'd be great. You could trick them all and you could start and become a Portuguese, <laughs> start a Portuguese thing and then come back and say, by the way, you know, <laughs> why not? That'd be great. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Sure. Good afternoon, Mr. Howard. Hi. Uh, you Kasha. need to hire Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Like, there we go. There you go. Hi. Okay. Hi. My name is Atoki. I'm a master's in acting student. Um, I was raised in New York since I was four years old, but I was born in another country, so I'm technically an international student. Where were you born? In Greece. Oh, in Greece? Yeah. Yeah, no. Long story. Well, good thing you're out of there right now. I didn't <laughs> <Yeah. get> <laughs> <laughs> For now. <laughs> My question is, um, as an international student on an F1 visa, what steps would I have to take towards joining SAG? Oh, this came up. Linda, right, with the guy, uh, remember the stunt guy from uh, Canada? But he was German. It's doable. Okay. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll remember. <laughs> Call me. I'll, I'll uh, but some, really, some I mean, Greek. it's doable on these, but it takes a little bit of careful work. But there is real international uh, cooperation, believe me. Far more, if I may say so, between the uh, the various acting unions and all, than with management. Okay. No, it's, it's very different. Yeah. There's a certain sharing of who can do what in what country, but you shouldn't have a problem here doing what you're trying at all. So if I want to, if I want to, I want to stay here and work here. Would it right. be harder for me than, let's say, an American citizen joining SAG, or would this process be pretty much the same? I wish I could give you a clear answer. All I know from a couple of times w when I got involved in this, uh, being here on a visa didn't preclude uh, doing what you're trying to do okay. um, at all. I'm not sure if, if, if it's a special thing they give you depending on the work you have. I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I know that both times it wasn't precluded. The answer wasn't no, it was yes, we can do this. Okay. So call me. I mean, seriously, that, that's a thing to be, it's unique. But, not that you do you do you also speak Greek? I speak French. It's been, it's very cool. All right, so fine. <laughs> One way or the other, I'm sure that's workable. All Absolutely. Right. Thank you very much. Sure. Hello. Hi. Um, since you started out as an actor and you were successful as it, um, what what would be um, what advice would you give to a starting actor in terms of um, breaking into the business or trying to? Well, I may sound a little antiquated, but I think you've got to get on stage someplace. I think that's how you learn so much, uh, performing a role live in front of an audience, no second take, again and again, not just a few times. You know, a, I think that's, that's a big difference in actors, and, and I, I made a mistake uh, uh, in a big, a big SAG meeting. I, I don't. I try not to make these mistakes before, but here I can be kind of candid. Somebody got up to the micro, microphone and said, "What is this infatuation that uh, the producers and casting directors have with these Australian actors who come in here and talk with an American actor and take all our jobs?" And before I edited myself, I said, "They're better." What do you mean they're better? I thought, well, they are. I mean, you've got young men and women who come in and they're in their 20s and they've already been on the stage in Sydney and they've already done Chekhov and Shakespeare and Ibsen and comedy and things and whatever and they're ready to go and that shows. 
they come in and they're off book and they do the audition well, who's and they look at the resume not just not, it's not the written resume only it's what you bring when you do that now there are exceptions uh, you know people who who never were on the stage I mean Clint's done just fine <laughs> <laughs> probably Jack Nicholson too but most of the time I think that and also I think that's the most fun it's the, it's the most uh, energizing, the most terrifying, the most fulfilling, the most where you're in control of it all. So I think doing that is a, is a big help. And I love working on film, and I think it's a whole other form that you learn and all, but you, you want to be doing it. And I mean, you can do it in classes, that's good too. I think you need to do it a lot. I mean, I even find this at times I, you know, you get sitting around to too long. Sometimes I just wind up working on something that I'm never going to do, whether it's uh, something from Shakespeare or some kind of song or something. So that you keep, you know, limber. you're young, you know, it's not that, but uh, I really do think you want to get out there. You don't want to wait around all the time because you're not getting better. Mm. And I think also there's a, there's a certain kind of fear factor. I think if you can overcome that stage fright, and there's no such thing as completely overcoming it, I mean, because it is live and you can get it wrong and it's hard to say, sorry, can I start again? You know, it's real pressure. <laughs> that I think you develop a kind of strength and a kind of ability to learn and know you have it in your head and detail that uh, it makes you better. Better on film and television. Yeah, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Felipe. My question was, I was recently working on a student film for the UCLA, and they submitted it to festivals and stuff, and it got approved by the SAG. Um, after that, uh, the producer and the director of the film, they approached me and told me if I was interested in joining the SAG, uh, just because since the film was approved, the actors that were in it had the chance to be in it. I didn't know what to say just because I, I am a Canadian resident. I was born in Colombia. I'm a Canadian resident, but I'm not a U.S either citizen or work permit or whatever. So when the person was talking about the, the international uh, characteristics of the, of the association, I was wondering, am I allowed? Is there, what are the restrictions? Uh, how does that work? One thing you can count on with almost no exception in this is that if you go in and you audition for a role mm -hmm. and they want you there's a way to work it out, whether it's uh, you're on a special thing or they taft Hartley, or the actor, and they may, there's a way to do this. It just doesn't happen that somebody goes, oh, well, no, because you're, you know, you're a whole different thing in Canada, so it doesn't work that way. I, I, there's always a way, if they want you, there's a, there's a way around it. Um, now, sometimes it can be, like if you're out of Canada, are you on an ACTRA card? No, I'm actually here on a tourist visa. <laughs> No, but I mean, so you're not a member of the Canadian. No. But if you were even, I mean, there, there, there is a sense, there really is of some sort of simpatico with the union internationally of trying to make this work so the actor doesn't get screwed because of some international set of rules, believe me. Okay. So I'm um, not sure what these producers, they sound like they were being encouraging. Why don't you ask them? I don't know, uh, but if they want to hire you, they're going to hire you. And if it's they, went, where you, they were they were in hire me. They were, I was doing it for a student film, so it wasn't on pay, so I could right. do that. Right. Uh, they were just offering me since the film was approved by SAG. They were offering me that I could be a part of it, but then they needed a social security number, and they didn't, I didn't know if I was even allowed to be a part of it if I wasn't. I'd be careful because because you know what the, you know what Taft Hartley is. You know that in place. All right, let me, uh, I'll use myself in as, a, as an example, and nothing changed. The first film I got, it was a lead, and it was a big role, but I'd never done anything in front of a camera. I had an equity card. So through Taft-Hartley, it means I've got the role. I now pay a certain amount of money, and on the salary that I got, I could either pay and become a member of SAG, or I could pay a limited amount and then there'd be a couple more jobs where I'd have to pay something by the third job then I'd have to join. Well, in my case, it was, I was getting paid well. I didn't even know any better, but I was getting paid well and it was a starring role, so I just, out of my salary, and joined SAG and was thrilled to be a member. So that's the way this works. The job proceeds, that's why there's a little bit of a 
complication we're working out with AFTRA because my notion has always been that the job precedes the union card. Yeah. Because, you know, you can get it. Yeah. You can get the job. They, they want you. They're not looking at that. And then you work from it. So I, I mean, I think it'd be great for you to join SAG, but I think what you really want to do is go out and try to land a job on film and then just play it out from there. Okay. Right? Yeah. And the rest of it will be what it is. That, yeah, that's what I thought initially. I just didn't know when, when they were talking about the international aspect of, of it. I didn't know if I maybe just passed out on a good opportunity just because I didn't have the information um, correctly. If they want you, they'll work it out. It's not, I mean, they really. I mean, <laughs> there might have been a time if, we, if you were from a country behind the Iron Curtain that we have a problem, but not when it's Canada. <laughs> okay. You know, not, <laughs> none of that. Not if it's France. Not if it's anything like that. Okay. Very doable. Okay. But, Thank you. Okay. I'm back. I have a lot of questions. You're back. But I'm just going to rotate. Um, <laughs> I'm Ashley Drayton, by the way. And I have another question. It says, considering. You can put the mic down so you don't have to be up on your toes. There, you there go. we go. Be there comfortable. Go. Be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I say, considering SAG doesn't guarantee anyone a job, what does SAG guarantee to its members? Well, one thing to keep in mind, and sometimes it gets lost because there's so much that SAG does that really is good for members, including, uh, I mean, aside from pension and health and, and protections in the workplace and safety and all that, there are all kinds of uh, uh, seminars and uh, helping with uh, tapes and all, all kinds of stuff that help you. But the part that sometimes gets forgotten is that Although, as a member, you, you receive all of, the, uh, all of the things that anybody does, no matter how much or how little money you make, as long as you're a member. But the very important areas like pension and health and all this are the result of how much money you put in. Sometimes this gets lost, that over years later, somebody's bothered because, you know, where's my pension and where's my health and it's not very big, and you, but that's because you didn't make so much money. It all has to do with hitting certain levels. So there, that's a big thing they do. If you mean the other, uh, what fascinates me still is how much SAG in particular, I, after it does too, but I'm more familiar with, I mean, I'm in both, both unions, but I'm more familiar with SAG, the remarkable amount of outreach and various social issues and helping actors with various things that they do for members of the union if you go to it, more than just, you know, contractual or safety issues. So that's what you get uh, for being a member. Uh, what I think you really get, though, for being a member is, is a level of protection, particularly SAG, that you have to have, not only in terms of getting paid, getting paid correctly, but also hours and safety on a set and a lot of things that they've fought for years to get that are quickly overlooked if, if you don't have a union to protect you. Okay, and my next question was the insurance through SAG, is that available to family members also, such as husband, um, son, daughter, all of that as well? Is that offered to them? This all has to do with the amount that you Put are earning. again? Okay. Well, I see what I mean? It makes sense, doesn't it? Yes. The more you're earning, the more flexibility, the more it's... Uh, I, I, but I know that there are ways that that money uh, can be for the two of them. But I'm really thinking as you get older, you're so young. But okay. down the line, all the way down the line, mm -hmm. yes, it can be for you and your spouse and also even set up that if one of you, that if you pass away, it still goes on to the spouse. So there's all kinds of very good protections that way, very good, okay. both in pension and the health plan. Remember, the health plan is always adjusting to the economy. That's a little different than pension. Oh, okay. That's why it can't be set, because just as it does nationally, it's changing according to what the economy is. But it's mm -hmm. been very, it's certainly, it's been strong for me. I mean, I, I worked a lot, and, and so I was able to put a, a good deal of money in as, as a member. But as an example, I, I had a, a kidney transplant in the year 2000. And you know what, that's how much that money, that, and all the follow-up is, really. It's mm -hmm. extraordinary sums, and that was totally covered, as have been many other things both for me and for my wife, under SAG Health and, and also under pension. So it's extraordinary. And it's something, uh, I, I can't say this too strongly, and I want to come at it the, kind of in the reverse way. I've had a lot of members say to me, we've got to make these young people aware. 
You know, they, they have no idea of how important this is as you get older and this and that. And I'll say to them, yeah, I know what you mean. Did you think about this when you were in your 20s? I didn't. <laughs> when you're 30, I didn't. I mean, I joined and I signed and I wish people would try to do the right thing, but it was not in my mind. You know, it wasn't in my mind. So it's like you're asking people of a certain age to start thinking like we are, and we're a lot older. So even if the information's out there and there's some awareness, let's not get too picky. As long as there's some awareness of down the road, mm -hmm. plan, think a little bit ahead. But you're, you're only supposed to do that so much at your age or you're an old <laughs> fuddy-duddy. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. And real quick, I do have a question. I've had a lot of students that have asked me about financial core. So what I'd love, if you could give them the definition of what that is and why it's good or why it would be bad. I don't, I honestly don't think there's anything good about financial core. If you make a great deal of money, uh, there may be other exceptions, but this is what I think of with financial core. core. If you make a great deal of money and you think, you've got yourself covered and you don't need to uh, to pay dues or pay whatever or you don't need need some stinking union you know you're on your own and you're fine then uh, you can do that a couple of things about that uh, careful the funny business in terms of where your protections are as life goes on and also I always thought there was something sort of I don't know, wrong about that or too selfish. I think there's something to be said for uh, being supportive of your fellow members and your fellow actors, particularly when it's a minimal comp contribution in that case. You know, some people, it's very hard for them to make the dues and the payments and all because they're right on the edge, even though they know they need the protections. I think when somebody's making a, a great deal of money, it's uh, something wrong about just dumping the union going on. I think it, it can be a mistake, too, even in their own interest. That's what I don't like about it. And also, we've actually been talking kind of on the down low with George Clooney and I and a few others of down the line this after merger of looking into uh, an area where, where people who are making a lot of money or not a, not a rule, but kind of an in, encouraged and get around that, that a certain small percentage of every extra million can be put into the new union. Because now the cap is a million. Anybody making over a million dollars, you know, you don't charge it. And it was George's idea, really. He said, how about somebody, and he didn't get into the numbers, but, you know, George makes a lot of money. And he was completely willing to uh, find some percentage that was substantial, but, you know, I, I, I don't know, half of the one percent of something, you know, that you contribute on each extra million. And I think there would be a lot of people who would support doing that. I don't know what the agents would think, but the, the members would. And from that, sometimes it's almost grassroots. There's a feeling of that that's part of what you're trying to do to help your fellow man and da da da. And I, I, that might work very well with actors and be very, very helpful to the union for things like, um, you know, the emergency fund itself is huge. I mean, I, I mean, it's a huge issue. It's not nearly as big as we'd like it to be, but it's a huge issue. This is for somebody who suddenly can't work. Uh, it's also a strike fund. Various things happen in the business where people. Uh, whatever happens in their lives, they really need help and the union can be there. And it's, it's great when the union can be there and that amount of money, uh, there's never too much for that. So. Hi, my name is Gabriela. I'm a filmmaking student and uh, my question is, with this upcoming merger, uh, what will be the consequences for directors and producers? What will change after this, after this merger of the two unions? What will change for directors and producers? I think very little, quite frankly. Not, 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 nothing. There may be, if, if I have my way, there may be a little bit more sharing of, of profit and a little higher salaries. Uh, one of the problems we have now exactly in the film business, uh, just as an example, is a really imbalanced uh, kind of thing where they get a, a star or two, you know, they get Cameron Diaz and Leonardo DiCaprio, and they pay them each $20 million. And, and the understanding is all other actors work at minimum. And it's like, there's a way to not have it quite that way. There's a way to have them both make a great deal of money, but some piece of this gets spread around among all the other actors, so they're all man managing to pay the rent and feed the kids, and the two top ones. And it's not really up to the actors. It's up to a kind of structure 
you come up with a math that says basically, if this is the budget for actors, then this percentage of it has to be shared among a certain number. There's a way to do it. In the long run, uh, it may, uh, I just, I don't see where that hurts the final pro product at all. I think where it, may, it makes for a, a healthier economy. But here's where we're into, you know, profit versus participation. That's almost a, a microcosm of the national study. You know, when you look, I don't want to get into national politics, but when you look at the American economy, you know, it's doing very well. It's going up and up and up and up. But the line in terms of the, in, the, work, the workers, all the people involved except for 1%, the top one, is right. just slightly just above what's growing there. So there's a big gap. Mm -hmm. My thing is you, you want to shorten that gap a little. You move it even a little bit. There's still a big gap, and a lot of those people are a lot better off. So there's a big social aspect, a social conscience aspect to doing all this, I remind myself of this every now and then when I think, how did I get myself into this? Because <laughs> it takes a lot of time. But that's really at the heart of it, is protecting the rank and file, protecting, art, protecting artists, performers, actors who are in this for the love of it, but they have to make a living, and just on, on some level, protecting them against, uh, against real economic decline. And it's very, very doable. There will be like new rules in, in terms of the contracts then, like the way that they're gonna be approached. Well, the way the new rules will happen is that the next time we go into a commercial contract or later uh, the TV theatrical contract in the, in the fall of 2013 into 2014 is we're in a position to be, uh, to make more serious demands and, and hold to them as one union mm -hmm. because, uh, because we're controlling all of the talent. It's all under one tent. And that's the way you negotiate in the marketplace is to have it all. And it's not a matter of being greedy. It's a matter of saying, now, work with us a little bit. You need to, you need to share a little bit more here in ways that we can follow. Got it. Thank collect. you. Thanks. Thank you. You again. Yes, the Brazilian. You haven't, gone to, you haven't gotten your flight to Portugal yet? <laughs> no, no, I'm Brazilian. <laughs> um, well, I'm American. Okay, um, so you had mentioned um, find the job and then the, the opportunity will present itself. But uh, in my experience, it's been very difficult to find even the audition for that. And I was wondering what your advice would be um, because to try to find the agent, they're more interested in those in the union. and then They're they more interested in what? A lot of the agents that I've been in contact with, they're just more interested in those already in the union, and they just seem to drop non-union actors. Like, uh, they keep them in interest, and then they just kind of drop them after a while. <clears throat> get on the stage, because that's the best way to be seen. And then it's not so hard to get somebody to come see you on the stage who tells somebody else, and then an agent, and then that's you know, it's a tight. I mean, maybe that that was my good fortune, but you know, it's one thing to walk into an office. An agent. It's another thing for them to see you in full array and in battle up there, singing and acting and crying and doing your stuff and seeing the talent. I mean, because uh, this is a business that does not know what that is in this town, I assure you. There is talent that didn't have a chance just coming in for a meeting, but, but on the stage and what's seen and heard. There, there's an agent, the f actually a rather successful agent in New York, and he used to tell this story on himself, and, and he was a guy who did quite well. He said his claim to fame was that he turned down Barbara Streisand twice. Because, you know, this big nose, funny girl who looked all eager, came in and talked to him and just wanted to whatever, and sang a little song. Yeah. He made the mistake. And then somebody went down and saw her and sang and performed went, oh my God, what a talent. And off and running. And that's happened on little theaters and on the stage, little independent films, where you get the opportunity to show, show what you got. Because other, otherwise, it's, it's who's cute and, or who looks exactly right for a certain role. You know what used to get me every now and then, and I was pretty established. I mean, people knew who I was. It didn't happen too often, but they'd have me come in and usually I try to get off book and be ready to shoot it. You know, they say, oh, oh no, we know it's a process and uh, we don't expect you to be prepared. 
excuse me, but bullshit. They want to see the final performance. The more they see it right there, the way they can shoot it, the better chance you have. But I had it happen a couple of times. My wife will corroborate this. I'd come in and after, they'd say, no, he was terrific, but you know, he's, he's just too big for the part. He's too, he's too tall for the role. I said, now wait a minute. This you know. You know, uh, you know, this you can see on the resume. You don't have to meet me to know that I'm 6'6". Six, six. Then you realize that actors fudge a little. You know, people come and say, oh, you really are 6'6". Six, six. You know, it's not like actor height, you know. That always bothers me when you come in and they say, you know, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I, I, I never mind going in and auditioning for stuff and showing them what I've got because, uh, uh, you know, they get to do that. They get, they, they get to expect that. But you, you really need to be able to show them what you can do. And a lot of times, even what they're asking you to read, there's not enough there. Mm -hmm. It's not like you do a whole speech like you do when you're trying to get into it. I remember when I auditioned for Stella Adler and this whole big board of people for the Yale Drama School. The two things I did, one was you had to have contemporary and classic. I did mm -hmm. a speech by Jamie in Long Day's Journey and Tonight. And I did uh, the Tomorrow and Tomorrow speech at the beginning of it for Macbeth. But both of those roles, even though it was college, I played. So I played in the audience and had it inside me, so I sort of knew how to do it. And that's how you show, show something, you know, what you've got. It's very hard to come into some office, you know, and, and just do something put in front of you. So that's another reason to get on the stage to, to, to be seen in that light or, or, or to get the kind of footing that maybe you can go in and impress them. I know it's very hard, though, to get an agent first. It's kind of a catch-22. You have to be seen uh, to get an agent. So that's my simplest solution is to, is to find a self that's, find a showcase for yourself so that can, somebody can see you at work. Okay. Thank you so okay. much. Sure. Uh, well, I would like to thank you sure. um, on behalf of not only the New York Film Academy but myself. We also have a little gift for you. A job? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Based on your 40 plus years in the entertainment industry, we would like to present you with an honorary master's degree in filmmaking. Oh, great. Thank you very much.